Thank you, Jane. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so much easier when I have to introduce myself. So like Jane said, I've uh, been researching Mongolian foreign policy and Mongolian language for um, for quite a while, about five years now, 15 months of which is in Mongolia. Um, and what I'm presenting today is based roughly on my MA thesis. I just finished my MA at the University of British Columbia uh, in Vancouver, Canada. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and dive into the presentation. Um, our basic outline for today is going to be divided into three parts. Uh, first, going to talk a little bit about Mongolia in general, uh, focusing specifically at Mongolia's recent political history. I'm then going to move into um, a discussion about international democratization, and then conclude with a couple implications, both theoretical uh, and as well as some policy recommendations. So looking at Mongolia, um, in Mongolia's modern political history, we can divide um, that history into more or less three sections. Uh, from about the late 16th century, Mongolia, Inner and Outer Mongolia, became part of the Qing Empire. And in 1911, Mongolia, Outer Mongolia declared its independence uh, as a, a more or less Buddhist uh, kingdom. In 1924, uh, following the communist revolution, Mongolia became the second communist state uh, in the world as the Mongolia People's Republic, at which point it was tied very closely to the Soviet Union, of course. But it's important to note that Mongolia never became part of the Soviet Union, although uh, it was often referred to as the 16th Republic. Um, its de jure independence was never really challenged in that period. Um, as well, Mongolia is quite distinct from the rest of Central Asia um, because it didn't, as I said, it didn't join the Russian Empire or didn't join the Russian sphere rather until 1924, whereas the rest of Central Asia was dealing as then uh, more or less part of Russia since the 17th century. Um, in 1990, following a period following a period of peaceful protests and some hunger strikes throughout the country. The Mongolian Communist Party announced that it would be stepping down and begin to pursue political and economic liberalization. So today, uh, Mongolia is, in terms of landmass, quite a large country, about two and a quarter times the size of Texas, and a population of less than three million, making it the least densely populated uh, country on the planet. Almost half. Uh, of these people now live in the capital, Ulaanbaatar, but um, another quarter or so are pastoralists, with the, with the remaining quarter um, located in some of the larger cities throughout the countryside. At the same time, in 2011, Mongolia was the fastest growing economy in the world with 17.7% GDP growth in real terms. That number has since gone down, 2012 was about 12% or so but still uh, among the top performing economies, the top growing economies. Its democratization has been very successful. Um, even though Mongolia was the only country to pursue both political and economic reform simultaneously, uh, it still managed to get through, which is something that um, I think a lot of economists and political analysts at the time certainly weren't expecting. Um, and the results are they're really rather clear. It's held, Mongolia has held six parliamentary and five presidential elections, all of which have resulted in a successful transfer of power. There have been, um, there have certainly been allegations of fraud, um, allegations of political manipulation, but generally international observers have ranked the elections as free and fair. In the Q&A a little bit, I'd be happy to talk about some of the more recent um, election problems, including the 2008 incident uh, protest, as well as the 2012 parliamentary election, uh, which I was serving as an observer for, especially, and uh, I know that in the US, a lot of, um, there's a lot of concern over the jailing of previous president and buyer, and I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit later if anyone has questions about my views on that 
particular issue. Um, but more or less, Mongolia's democratization has definitely been successful. It's been consistently ranked as a flawed democracy by Democracy Index, which while admitting problems, also shows that Mongolia is definitely above a hybrid or authoritarian regime, um, as most of the countries in its immediate neighborhood are. It's been consistently ranked as free by Freedom House, and just to put one final note on it, Mongolia held the presidency for the Community of Democracy just recently, and um, just last month held their annual meeting uh, in Uzlanbadar, further pointing to Mongolia's successful democratization. Backing up a little bit, um, the, the role of democratization in Mongolia's political change since the 1990s has, of course, resulted in a lot of change in Mongolia's concept of foreign policy and Mongolia's um, understanding of their own national security. So when we begin to look at both the concept of foreign policy, which was most recently revised in 2011, as well as the concept of national security, it quickly becomes apparent that Mongolia is keen to avoid losing its independence or its autonomous decision-making ability to either China, as it did during several centuries of Qing domination, or to Russia, as it did when it became a de facto Soviet satellite state in 1921-24, um, as we discussed earlier. So in response to this new international reality with Mongolia becoming a democracy, the Soviet Union um, falling apart, Mongolia showed remarkable adaptability in its foreign policy. Uh, and the largest, or the most distinctive part of this foreign policy has been called the third neighbor policy. So by the third neighbor policy, it doesn't refer to any one country in particular but rather it's referring to a number of countries that Mongolia seeks to actively engage in a number of sectors, including economic, diplomatic, and military-to-military -military relations. Uh, key foreign, key, sorry, key third neighbors identified in the most recently released concept of foreign policy include Japan, South Korea, Canada, Australia, the U.S., and a number of EU member countries. And so this is really where um, I start to see a bit of a puzzle and what I'm going to try to answer a little bit today. I think if you look at Japan and South Korea's engagement with Mongolia, um, it's pretty easy to, to say that that's mostly part of those own countries' regional engagement, and it'd be quite odd for those countries not to pursue relations with Mongolia. Um, Canada and Australia both have significant mining interests in the country. Um, including um, Australia's Rio Tinto, which holds um, Oyutolhoi, which is in south, southern Mongolia, and it's the world's largest copper mine. We're getting ready to rev up the world's largest cop copper mine. But when I begin to look at U.S. relations, and even EU relations, I'm going to focus on the U.S. today, it's not quite clear. Um, exactly what the driver would be. It's hard to just chalk up. Well, let me talk about Mongolia's relationship with the U.S. a little bit first. Um, so Mongolia has contributed over 1,000 troops to Iraq and Afghanistan and another 1,000 troops or so to U.N. peacekeeping missions, which, although it's not a huge number compared to Mongolia's 3 million people, I think it's a pretty significant um, contribution. Uh, this has been matched by... Um, U.S. military cooperation, including a number of training exercises and technological assistance, the most visible of which includes Han Quest, which is an annual training exercise held in uh, South Gobi. It's multinational, so it's the U.S., um, India, a number, a number of other states from around the region, as well as exercise Gobi Wolf, which is... Um, uh, a U.S.-led program that's supposed to prepare Mongolia's military for um, sort of emergency situations, especially envi environmental emergencies. Uh, Mongolia's received roughly $285 million from the Millennium, uh, Millennium Cooperation, as well as another $20 million from uh, USAID. That's not a terribly large amount of money. Um, trade is also rather limited. So trade 
um, although increasing very much from 2008 to 2011, um, it remains pretty minimal. There have been moves to, uh, to increase that trade through 2004 Trade and Investment Agreement and 2012 uh, a new transparency agreement was implemented. There's also, of course, some talk about um, the U.S. mineral uh, extraction company Peabody uh, perhaps having some um, perhaps being awarded the Tavantolkoi coal and gold deposit. But nothing is for certain on that yet. So that's just a picture of uh, Mongolia's, a, a ceremony that was held for Mongolia's peacekeepers have uh, peacekeeping forces. Uh, so I don't think that we can chalk up the ties between Mongolia and the US through just economic or strategic goals. I think economic relations remain minimal. There are no large mining contracts. Talvin Tolkoy, as I said, it remains undecided. Geostrategically, um, I think it's very, it'd be very easy to say Mongolia is located between Russia and China. And so, of course, the U.S. Uh, would be interested in engaging Mongolia simply on those, simply on that geographical fact. But I don't, but we definitely don't see that kind of engagement. First of all, the U.S. has no permanent troop station in the country. Uh, secondly, Mongolia has declared neutrality between Russia and China, and as part of that neutrality has declared that it won't allow its territory to be used for actions against its two neighbors. And this is pretty easy to understand because such an action on Mongolia's part would not bring Mongolia more security. It would just make Mongolia as opposed to this um, northern neighbor for China or southern neighbor for Russia. It would turn it into quite a security uh, issue. And I don't think Mongolia is keen to be keen to enter into such engagement. So then I thought to myself, how can we really explain the U.S.'s role as Mongolia's third neighbor, and indeed one of its more prominent third neighbors? And so what I'd like to propose is that democracy, Mongolia's successful democratization, um, is beneficial for Mongolia in pursuing its third neighbor policy, but also beneficial for the U.S., uh, as well as the EU and the U.N., as drivers of international democratization. Turning to the U.S. support for international democratization, uh, the U.S. supports democratization for a number of reasons, uh, many of which were first introduced and really gained prominence after 9-11. And so the U.S. has stated that it views democratization as key to global stability because of the perceived inherent domestic legitimacy that democratic elections, uh, as well as um, open market economies, are seen to provide. And the U.S., of course, recognizes that national security is reliant on global security. Um, there's also, of course, a lot of talk about the democratic peace theory, which holds that democracies don't go to war with each other. Um, Democratization is also seen as key to long-term long economic growth by fostering freedom of expression, which leads to uh, more innovation, also supports the rule of law and allows predictability for investors. So predictability perhaps is one part that um, Mongolia sometimes fails at for its international investors. We can talk about that more later. And of course, um, this U.S. supports democratization hasn't been without significant policy backing. Uh, USAID has a significant budget for um, supporting democratic actors. The National Doubt for Democracy is, of course, uh, an important source as well. Uh, specifically to Mongolia, the uh, International Republican Institute is working in Mongolia, hosting a number of forums and build, building civil society relations. Um, in the country. This support to interna international democratization has, uh, of course, been global, but also there's been specific support to Mongolia. And this is seen through a number of high-profile visits. Um, 
first of all. So 2005, President George Bush visited the country for the first time. Um, 2011, Mongolian President Takhyagin Azbiturch uh, visited the U.S., which prompted uh, the re resolution of support for partnership between the U.S. and Mongolia. 2011, Vice President Joe Biden visited the country in 2012. Um, unfortunately, the one week I wasn't in Mongolia during the summer, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton visited the country as well. During all of these visits, there's been specific attention, and the bulk of the attention has been paid, uh, at least in press conferences, to Mongolia's role in the democratic community, as well as pointing out that Mongolia really stands as a firm example um, that both political, that economic liberalization and political liberalization can be pursued simultaneously, and that perhaps you can't even pursue one without pursuing the other. Um, but it's my idea, Hillary Clinton said that very explicitly uh, during her visit to the country. Um, and it was largely seen as aimed at China, of course, but I think it also also holds true for other countries in East Asia. Uh, then previous Ambassador Adelton identified democracy as one of five pillars in U.S.-Mongolian relations. Most recently in 2012, Mongolia was granted membership into the OSCE, um, recognizing Mongolia's importance to the democratic community. Furthermore, um, when Mongolia imp implemented its NATO Individual Partnership and Cooperation Program in 2012, uh, democracy was its democratic transition as well as its um, commitment to peacekeeping were, were brought up significantly in the press release. So what I'm saying is that everybody wins from this type of engagement. Mongolia's democratization had more than domestic ramifications. It had international ramifications in the sense that it allowed the country to pursue a foreign policy that allowed it not to just be tied to Russia or China, but allowed it to branch out, allowed it to create partnerships with other democratic countries um, in a way that it otherwise couldn't have done had its democratization not been successful. Um, just to conclude with some of the implications that I see for this argument that dem democratization has more than domestic ramifications. Um, theoretically, and I'll spend as short a time as possible, um, theoretically when I'm looking at Mongolia, um, identify Mongolia as a small state, of course not based on land mass, land mass is quite large, um, but based on population, but as well um, as a number of other factors. And so I think that with states like Mongolia and perhaps branching out um, to other countries in the region, we, have to, we can start to come up with a stronger definition for small states in the contemporary international system. Uh, by which I mean, Mongolia certainly, certainly um, is certainly a small state as a result of its population, but also as a result of its still grow, growing but still limited uh, economic engagement of a number of other factors. So perhaps looking at small state foreign policy from a relative uh, perspective would be more useful here. Moving forward, if we're talking about using democratization or perhaps sort of normative appeal uh, of a small state to attract other countries, uh, in the case of Mongolia, to attract the U.S. and the EU, it still kind of leaves me uncertain about how exactly we can define how Mongolia is attracting these countries. Yes, it's democratized, but is that something that we can call small power? Or is that something more specific to small states? Uh, finally, I think this, this study has comparative potential, uh, by which I mean that Mongolia is not the only country that has done this, but a number of other countries, especially ex-Soviet bloc countries, have successfully pursued democratization. And as a result, have been able to um, increase their international standing.
And just to conclude, finally, with some broad policy recommendations for both large states, uh, in this case the U.S., and small states, in this case Mongolia. First of all, I think it has to be recognized that Mongolia is not um, – Mongolia is pursuing a, a policy of diversification in its foreign relations, but is not looking for protection. It's not looking to be part of a U.S. security umbrella. And as I explained earlier, I think that that would be actually more detrimental um, to its security. The U.S. then needs to recognize, of course, I think the U.S. has recognized that strategic objectives in Mongolia are not a viable option. And thirdly, this idea of small power, soft power, um, just democratization needs to be rewarded. For small states, uh, small states like Mongolia, um, as well as other countries, need to recognize that military options are not viable. The U.S. Is, is, sorry, Mongolia has certainly recognized this. Perhaps uh, some other small states haven't. So North Korea stands out, perhaps. And finally, um, Mongolia is sort of pursuing what I call ethical neutrality. I think it's a very viable option for small states, where it is neutral. Um, and it is, it, is, it is neutral between its two neighbors, but it also displays um, a certain normative appeal by adopting the norms uh, and ethical behaviors that are espoused by the international community, especially by uh, the U.S. and the EU. I think that's a very viable option as well. So with that, let me go ahead and open the floor for any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, we already have questions coming in, and we have a few that have come in through email. And while we're uh, getting to these, if you can go ahead uh, to the audience, if you can go ahead and submit your questions to the chat pod down at the bottom of your screen. Here, here's a question that came right off the top. That could you expand on the elaborate a bit on the policy of neutrality specifically? And maybe it, it touches on this ethical neutrality that you spoke of on your last slide. Yeah, so um, Mongolia has declared itself neutral between, um, in, in case of any, um, let's say, international disagreement between Russia and China, um, and it's also declared that it's not, it won't use, it won't allow its territory to be used against either of its two neighbors, um, whether it be by an outside country or by one of those neighbors specifically. Okay. Hey, uh, here's just uh, another question, and this is purely because uh, I don't have any depth in this particular area. Uh, what kind of comparisons do you see across the region? I mean, uh, uh, Mongolia is sandwiched there. Do, do you see anything like maybe Kazakhstan, uh, possibly Kyrgyzstan, North Korea? What are, what are some s folks that are going through similar issues in the, in the region? Right. Uh, I think that, you know, surprisingly, the, the best example um, right now in some ways is definitely Burma or the, you know, Myanmar. Um, and by pursuing sort of even limited political liberalization, it's been able to expand uh, its international engagement exponentially, right? And suddenly, um, Hillary Clinton, President Biden, right now. Kurdistan might be an interesting, an interesting point of comparison as well, in the sense that in the early 1990s, it was identified as sort of the Switzerland of, of Central Asia, not only because it has uh, beautiful mountains, but also because um, comparatively it became the most politically and economically liberal of those countries. The problem, of course, the comparison now is that those dreams perhaps haven't been as um, as successful as Mongolia has been. So uh, Kyrgyzstan political situation, economic situation has sort of failed to take off in the same way that Mongolia has. On that same theme of uh, neutrality, how do you maintain that neutrality? It's okay to say that you are, and people would respect that, but do you have really any 
uh, does, does Mongolia have any anything that they can leverage to maintain that neutrality in the face of uh, their neighbors? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm going to answer it a little bit roundabout. So the neutrality of the two neighbors is also based on the idea of balancing the influence of both those neighbors through the third neighbor policy, right? Um, in, in that respect, third neighbor policy has been successful in some ways and not successful in others. Um, in terms of uh, military cooperation, uh, military training exercises has been quite quite successful as I've demonstrated. Uh, economically, though, Mongolia uh, remains pretty much in the sino-economic sphere, something like 86% of Mongolia's exports are going to China uh, and a significant number of their imports as well are coming from China. And so in that sense, uh, Mongolia has, of course, not been able to completely balance that influence. In terms of its neutrality, though, I don't think it's had really any problems at all. Um, there is perhaps more military engagement with Russia as opposed to China. I think that has more uh, historical, more of a historical base than anything else. Okay, and maybe the a similar question, but coming at it from a different way. This, if uh, Mongolia tries to implement democratization, uh, does this inoculate them from from Russia and China influence, or does it put a target on their back? I mean, uh, if you're sandwiched between Russia and China, you, there's just not enough McDonald's you can put in there to stave off the communist hordes. Uh, how does this affect this declaration of uh, democratization and, and neutrality? Uh, does it, are they at the table or are they on the menu? I think they're very much at the table. Um, I don't think that there's actually been any, any targeting of Mongolia as a result of its democratization or as a result of its increasing engagement um, with the U.S. Um, but I think that that's mostly because of a couple of things. First of all, I think both Russia and China recognize that taking an aggressive policy, putting that target uh, near Mongolia, it would be counterproductive. And so I'm sure that uh, neither Russia or China want to see the U.S. having sort of military presence in Mongolia. And indeed, China was suspicious of uh, Han Quest even uh, during its first couple of years, although now it's increasingly coming as an observer. Uh, and seems to have dropped a lot of its objections to these uh, military exercises. But back to my point is that um, both Russia and China know that if if they ensure that Mongolia doesn't view them as a security threat, Mongolia probably won't engage um, won't engage with the U.S. or the EU in any way that would actually be detrimental to their own national security. And this is true of China's larger foreign policy as well in terms of its peaceful rise, right? So it certainly fits into that larger policy framework. So who do you see as the, 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 the champions of this democratization uh, uh, neutrality movement from Mongolia? If, if the imp influence of, of the U.S. or the EU, for that matter, uh, causes a regional gag reflex, who, who can be the champions for Mongolia? Could you explain that question a little more? Um, be helpful. Yeah, in, in a number of the slides, it, it, you, you mentioned that uh, by coming in doing the normal types of uh, the levers of, of influence that uh, the U.S. and the EU, to a lesser extent, uh, normally flexes to help countries that are striving this way. Um, if that causes a problem with uh, specifically Russia and China, who else could could Mongolia turn to be the champion of their uh, their uh, democratization or uh, uh, neutrality efforts? Right. I think that right right now, definitely, the U.S. and EU engage with Mongolia is not causing any problems. Um, and I don't see any reason for, that that would change in the foreseeable future. Um, regionally, though, of course, Mongolia. Um, 
is partnering with a number of other countries that perhaps would have less of a disruptive influence, um, but perhaps not. The Mongolia's relationship with South Korea and Japan, of course, um, is continuing to deepen due to historical and cultural ties, but also increasingly economic ties and um, so the Mongolian expat community in both those countries as well. Um, there's a limited role perhaps as well for India, uh, Indian-Mongolian relations have sort of slowly been stepping up, um, but given China and India's um, history and some significant uh, issues that are affecting their own cooperation, I'm not sure that would be the best option for Mongolia either. Okay, thank you. So, if if you could just uh, one big thought for a takeaway for your presentation, what would that be? What were your closing thoughts? Right. Um, in closing, I want to say that uh, first of all, I'm not saying that Mongolia democratized solely because of the international uh, and foreign policy benefits this would have, but and it was certainly a domestically driven process. But that through that democratization. Uh, Mongolia's benefit has not only been in its own territory and has not only been to its own people, but has also been for expanding its foreign policy reach, its international reach, and that by working within these international norms and acting um, in a sort of <laughs> ethically neutral fashion, uh, Mongolia has been able to, to gain quite a lot from that experience, and that that could also carry on uh, into other small states and similar situations as well. Mm -hmm.